me pass you over to Dr. Marcin Nazaruk. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline, and um, welcome. Good morning. It is our pleasure to welcome you to this first webinar organized by the Human Factors Working Group on the topic of human factors in contract prequalification. My name is Dr. Marcin Nazaruk, and I'm the co-chair of the Human Factors Working Group. By background, I'm an industrial psychologist and a safety professional, and I've spent the majority of my career helping organizations in the high hazard industries to improve their safety and efficiency by using applied psychology. In 2017, I envisioned that human factors should be part of the contractual expectation uh, in the same way as having a safety management system is. I also wrote the very first draft of those questions. A few years later, I'm delighted to see that, albeit with some modifications, a few of those questions are now live in the UK SQL system. SQL, the oil and gas industry pre-qualification uh, scheme, has now published seven questions focused on demonstrating and uh, integrating the practical application of human factors. This means that any company wishing to bid for work in the UK oil and gas industry has to demonstrate how they integrate human factors into their organization and processes. And another important implication is that the major oil and gas operators are using these human factors questions from SQL globally in their respective request for proposal and pre-qualification questionnaires. And so what that means is that all companies bidding for work globally with the majors will have to also answer these questions that we'll discuss today. And uh, today's webinar, uh, we will start with the introduction to uh, SQL, a pre-qualification scheme to understand how it works. And after that, we will focus on the human factors questions and we'll go through some examples based on the existing industry guidance. Next slide, please. And so without further ado, let me introduce Sakti Norton. She is the SQL Scheme Manager, ensuring that SQL brings together the buying and supplying communities in reducing risk in our industry. Sakti, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marsan. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, really pleased to be here as part of this collaborative webinar on human factors. Uh, so as the scheme manager of SQL, I'll, I'll give you a, a very brief overview um, of SQL. As Carolyn said, the slides will be shared um, with all attendees. So there's a, a little bit more detail um, for reference as well. Um, SQL launched just in May of last year, so we're coming up to a year now uh, of operations. Um, we're a new pre-qualification service um, for the um, oil and gas and the energy industry. I'm going to assume this audience is fairly familiar with pre-qualification schemes and uh, pre-qualification services, but just in a nutshell, it, it really is just a means um, for suppliers to centrally input um, all of your information um, once. Uh, and then keep updating that and and then for buyers to be able to um, search and review all of that supplier pre-qualification information in one place. Um, so we really as a, as a not-for-profit um, operatorship we are operated by Logic um, and you'll be you might be familiar with Logic um, who operates um, other industry schemes like Vantage, POB, Master Deed, Halimat, and so on. Um, we're industry owned, we're not for profit. And so our purpose and our purpose with SQL um, is really to um, support the industry in reducing risk, um, increasing efficiency, and in doing so, bringing about cost savings really for everyone as well um, at the same time. So you can see at the bottom here um, our current uh, SQL buyers. These organizations have all committed to using SQL for pre-qualification. Um, we do have a new buyer uh, just recently signed up as well, so do keep an eye out for the formal announcement on that uh, over the next couple of weeks. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So diving into the assessments, there are two types of assessments uh, in SQL. We've got the desktop assessment and the on-site assessment. Um, now, I won't really go into the on-site assessment today. This is um, only um, uh, required uh, if a supplier has selected uh, certain product or service codes that are deemed higher risk. Um, for example, you know, manufacture of equipment or 
um, offshore drilling services, um, that's when the on-site assessment would then be required and come into play. Um, in terms of the human factors questions, those are really very much part of the desktop assessment, so I'll concentrate on that today. So the desktop assessment is something that must be completed by all um, SQL registered suppliers. Um, they're broken up into three, uh, three sets as the general, which is the sort of financial um, company information, um, that sort of thing. We've got the HSC side, and that's, of course, where the human factors questions sit. Um, and we've got the quality set as well. Um, so really, after uh, completing the um, questions successfully through the desktop assessment. Um, these are assessed and um, the assessment team may, may well go back and forth with you to make sure that the, the questions have been um, responded, uh, responded to appropriately. And then once completing that and going through the whole process, um, that's when a supplier gets a status of compliant um, and becomes then fully visible to buyers and fully searchable. Um, on the SQL platform as well. Next slide, please. So the questions themselves, um, the overall structure, and this is very much so you'll see this for the quality question set and the HSE question set. It's a sort of a flow um, and your previous response tends to determine um, what question you're asked next within each sort of subsection. So generally, um, a lot of the questions might start with asking if you have a documented policy or documented procedure for something. Um, you know, do you have a documented human factors policy? Um, and it's a <clears throat> yes or no response. Um, if yes, you'd be directed to upload um, the relevant document. But if no, then we would ask you to describe how do you consider that or how do you manage um, that particular element? Um, essentially, we recognize that not every company may have, you know, a fully structured, documented um, process or procedure for everything, but that doesn't mean that you don't practice those things um, to, to a good standard. So, you know, we want to be able to ask you how you do that. And it doesn't matter if you've written it up into a document or if it's something that is communicated um, more directly within your company, we want to know what it is that you do. And so we want to give you the opportunity to describe that. Some of the other questions don't necessarily focus in on documents. Um, they just ask, do you do something? Do you have a behavior based safety program? Yes or no. So if yes, again, please tell us um, what it is that you do. Um, and if no, that is a valid response. Um, and, uh, and that's the end of the question flow as well. So you could have the next slide, please. So once you've um, submitted all of these responses, what, what exactly is being assessed? How are they assessed? Really, the um, I guess if I go back to you know where to have the questions come from, um, and where the assessment criteria come from, these have all come from SQL buyers, from the buying community, from the buyer working groups that we've got put together. Um, the SQL questions themselves initially, you know, we took all of these buyers' internal question sets, and as you can imagine, there was a lot of commonality um, across across all of the buyers. And we harmonized that and brought that together as a standardized um, SQL question set um, and uh, refined that um, again through buyer working groups, industry working groups and um, and through um, expert support as well as as Marsan has said. And then we continue to um, review and improve that on, a, on an annual basis and an ongoing basis as well. And so we have um, we have already made adjustments to the assessment criteria, which again has come um, directly from the buying community themselves. It does meet their requirements, but as we um, continue to operate SQL, we do know that um, we will uh, always be open to feedback and will adjust how we um, implement that criteria to make sure that it is working for both buyers and suppliers. And that's something we'll, we'll always continue to do. So on the whole, um, what is it that the assessment team are looking for? Firstly, of course, um, relevance, you know, documents or um, uh, descriptions that have been supplied are, are in fact relating to the question. Um, and then naturally each um, question will have its own you know question specific criteria specific points that we're looking for and it will be very similar between um, where I've said where we ask for a documented policy um, if you don't have a documented policy to describe then how just checking so um, I think you just went on mute just for a couple of seconds there okay um, so if that's okay if I can still be heard. 
Um, thank you. I'll carry on. Um, so, yes, every question will have question specific criteria. Um, and that is very, very similar between the criteria we're looking for in documented um, policies or procedures or um, descriptive, you know, descriptions of how it is that you manage things in your organization. Um, the points, you know, it doesn't matter how you how you've written it up or how you capture it, um, but the points that we're looking for, what it is that you do, um, those are the key criteria that the that the assessors um, will be um, looking for. And then when it comes to documents, of course, um, we uh, do check um, document dates, whether it's the date of document issue or date of last review, or um, certainly with certain um, uh, certifications or insurance documentation then expiry dates on that. Um, most uh, most documentation needs um, to be dated within the last two or three years um, of you know of the of the review. So it's it's good uh, you know we expect that if you do have a documented procedure um, and processes and so on that they haven't just been you know issued ten years ago and and left stagnant. Um, that uh, in fact they are being um, uh, consistently looked at um, and reviewed. So if I um, move on then to the next slide, please. So in terms of compliance, I've mentioned compliance at the start um, and that um, really what you're looking for is, you know, the first step obviously is becoming SQL registered exposes you to SQL buyers. Um, but the next step crucially, of course, is being fully compliant um, so that you do appear in searches and that buyers have that assurance that, you know, they, they are um, able to freely, you know, and, and quite um, clearly and assuredly work with you um, and be clear that, their baseline requirements have been covered. Now we recognize that the desktop assessment is a big piece of work. It, it, there are many questions. Um, you know, there are three very large uh, question sets. We anticipate it can take an organization from, you know, between one to six weeks at least uh, to complete um, because there is a lot of detail that we're asking for. The buyers are looking for a high level of, of assurance. Um, and so, you know, we encourage our suppliers to, to definitely take that time and take the time that you need to complete it, you know, to a good standard. And then once you're done the first time, following that um, on a year on year basis, um, you're simply updating things that have changed, up, updating, uploading new documents um, where you've got, um, you know, new renewals um, and so on. So it's a big job the first time, but what that means is it's going to save you a lot of time and effort um, and not having to input that same information again and again, um, you know, every time you go up for a tender or um, uh, get in touch with a new client to work with them. So, yes, every question is required. Um, but as I said before, in, in, in many cases, no is a valid response. So don't be don't be put off by that. The buyers do see all of um, their responses. Initially, they're looking for compliance status usually, and as I say, that influences um, by default whether you appear in um, their various searches that they can do. Um, but whether they choose to work with a supplier on the basis of specific responses is really down to each buyer. So they have all of the information, they all have the same information, and it's up to them to decide um, what they do with that information. Uh, so that, that keeps it. Um, very flexible for all the different SQL buyers that we have on board. And then, of course, the, the big question is, what is the impact of my compliance um, on, on my contracts? It's you know very unlikely to affect any of your current contracts. If you're currently in contract with SQL buyers, um, we don't anticipate anyone turning around and, and saying, you know, we're, we're now looking to, to break this contract if you're not compliant. No, but it, it may well affect um, your feedback, you know, your, your performance feedback, your contract performance reviews, for example. A buyer may look at your SQL responses and tie that back into, into feedback potentially. But the biggest impact, of course, is going to be on um, contract renewals. Um, and when it comes to going up for new business, going up for new tenders, that buyer's issue. The first thing they're going to be looking for is um, if you're a SQL supplier, that you're SQL compliant. Um, and ideally that you are um, SQL registered in the first place if they're if they're pulling out um, tender shortlists, for example. So that's really the um, in, a, in, a, you know, in a nutshell how that covers um, the compliance element. So just to finish off, um, contact details here, 
please do get in touch. You know, if you have any queries at all, general inquiries or specific queries, if you're already a SQL supplier working through your desktop assessment, the support team is there to support um, any you know specific questions on assessments as well. Um, and we can follow up with you know further support if if it's needed. Um, so please do get in touch with us, um, with the team, with myself. And um, I will pause there and hand over to Marsan to take you through the, the main feature of today's um, presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sekhti. It was fantastic to hear from you. And may I encourage everyone to um, type your questions while we are going through it, even if um, there is not enough time at the end to answer all of them. We'll take extra effort after today's session to then compile answers for every single question. So please do not hesitate to use the chat function um, to, um, to ask the question. So I will now share my screen and we'll move with the, um, with the next uh, part of our uh, session today. So, um, we'll use as a basis for our um, discussion the uh, guidance that we published uh, as part of the SP Human Factors Technical Section. And we wrote this guidance for a couple of reasons. Number one, to raise awareness about human factors, but then by aligning the content with the SQL questions, we were hoping to um, add this extra value to um, to to the users, the content of the guide is based on the existing industry guidance and standards, and we refer to those uh, inside. Uh, you can download it by going to the link, and I also pasted the link in the chat. We wanted to make sure that it's as practical as possible, and each topic uh, includes a benchmarking section, allowing quickly to identify and gauge. Uh, the gaps um, in your um, organization and we'll do some of that uh, today. So um, let's go through the actual questions, human factors questions that um, the companies have to answer as part of the SQL uh, pre-qualification. So we've got seven questions. The first question is about the human factors policy. So provide a copy and explain how it's implemented. And here I bolded some specific words I wanted to focus on. So the questions focus on the integration of human factors with the existing processes. In this sense, the human factors is not an initiative, it's not a communication campaign, it's not attitude or personality. Human factors is a set of tools and concepts that needs to be integrated with existing processes. And here we've got a list of those processes. So starting from point two, we see procedures, then incident investigations, risk assessment, um, proactive learning, so how to identify causes of accidents before they happen, uh, behavioral safety and um, consequence management that uh, could also be um, just culture. And then also we will be looking um, for the modern aspects of uh, demonstrating and understanding accountability. So um, because of the time, we won't have time to go through every single one, uh, today, but um, uh, the answers are in the guide. However, I would like to focus on some of them. Before we uh, get into the questions, um, we need to um, get aligned um, on the very basic uh, concept. So um, we need to get familiar with the foundational concept in human factors, which is error traps also known as performance shaping factors or performance influencing factors. So let's start with example. Have a look at this picture. This operator needs to operate this control panel. This means press the right buttons in the right sequence. What do you see on the picture that increases the chances of this person making a mistake? Just one moment to, to, to think about. OK, we can easily see a number of difficulties. Obviously, there are the pipes um, that restrict the movement of the hand, right? And to restrict the visibility. Then we've got the size of labels. Um, OK, I see the questions uh, flowing. Fantastic. Uh, I'll be able to take, um, take, take them at the end. So. Um, 
uh, thank you. And in the meantime, the, for example, explanations of, um, of BBS um, is in the guide uh, as well. So uh, continuing, um, things that uh, increase the, the chances. So you see the pipes that restrict the movement and visibility, the size of the labels above the buttons, colors and position of the buttons. And there may be also factors that are not visible on the photo, such as fatigue, broken radio, IODT procedure, or a conflict with a supervisor. So if we think about those conditions that increase the chances of error or non-compliance, um, the list of those factors is, is quite long. And here, this is not an extensive list, but let's start with the examples of error traps listed on um, the uh, on the left. So we see here, for example, um, complex procedures, poorly designed equipment, unfamiliarity with the situation, insufficient time, um, incorrect tools, fatigue, etc. Now, those conditions depend on other things in the organization. So, for example, an outdated procedure tells you something about the procedure management process. The poorly designed equipment tells you something about the design uh, process or purchasing requirements. High level of fatigue tells you something about managing working hours and resourcing the work. Insufficient time available tells you something about the planning process, etc. And so you see how we take a narrow trap with a condition in the work environment affecting the worker and how that condition then is further influenced by factors further up in the organization. And we call those things organizational factors, and some examples are in the table on the right hand side. So you see from staffing to management processes to planning, financing, uh, and many others. So this is this is important uh, concept. And so now with this, um, let's move on to our first topic, which will be the risk assessment. And I've selected the um, risk assessment because it helps us also to um, compare the, um, and actually I can start with that, compare the hazards with uh, the error traps. So what's the difference between them? So if we think about the typical risk assessment, and I know that it, the risk assessment comes in many shapes and forms, um, and different levels of sophistication, and that's fine. So here, this may be somewhat simplified, but the typical uh, risk assessment will have three stages. We take a task, break it down into steps, then we identify hazards. So hazards are typically defined as a source of harm. Um, and so we identify uh, hazards, and then for those hazards, we identify controls, right? So that is the typical process. Now, the assumption behind the risk assessment is that if we identify all the relevant hazards and introduce appropriate controls, then we sufficiently reduce the risk. And so now that's important, but that may be insufficient. In that photo I showed you earlier, uh, you've seen how error traps may contribute to failure. So how are the hazards different from error trap? If a if a hazard is a um, if a hazard is a potential source of harm, for example, pressure, spill, um, etc., hot surface, right? Then error traps. So, for example, visual similarity of buttons, not enough time to complete the job, or stuffing arrangements. Those things are difficult to be classified as a source of harm. So, however, they may contribute, and you that's probably not difficult to see how this may contribute to failure. So, error traps and organizational factors is a different category of factors that increase the likelihood of mistakes or doing something different from expect, expected. And so, understanding error traps and organizational factors takes us beyond hazard control and into how we manage the job and how we manage uh, the company. And so what you see on the slide is we've got the uh, the typical risk assessment enhanced um, or with the error traps added. So we've added a column for potential error traps that can be identified for the steps. And below you've got a, um, 
a list of prompts of different error traps on the top of has. And so the uh, adding error traps to the risk assessment process is the most basic, the most fundamental way that you can um, you can integrate human factors with the risk assessment. And so um, with this said, let's now, but that's there, there is a bit more to it. So let's do now a quick benchmarking exercise. I'll read out those um, statements and please think or mark uh, type for yourself whether you believe you're already doing it or maybe not yet. And that would help you to identify the gaps. So let's start from the top. Your risk assessment process covers includes error traps in addition to hazards. The risk assessment training covers error traps and how to identify them and what to do about them. Then error traps are integrated into various forms, templates um, that are used. Um, and so different forms of risk assessment from pre-job briefing to control of work uh, processes. So is are error traps part of that uh, templates or forms that you have? The number four is more about mindset. So here shortcuts are seen as behaviors incentivized by the work arrangements. Those in incentives are identified and addressed. Um, and here, um, what, what that means is that if we see somebody uh, skipping the steps in a procedure, that is likely that this is a form of adaptation. So for example, if you, if the, job takes five hours if you follow all the steps in the procedure but you have only three hours available to you people will be adapting uh, to that and so to optimize um, the optimize um, the job and so the resulting behavior um, it's important that the job conditions allow for execution of work in a way that is desired number five Frontline operators, supervisors, and other people supporting operations understand the concept of error traps and can point out a range of them um, from design to procedure quality to time available um, because you need that common understanding between different groups. And number six, people doing the uh, people doing the job who conduct the uh, pre-job risk assessment, uh, they can discuss the challenges they face um, and if you think about lack of tools, lack of time, um, lack of people, resources, etc., cetera, um, these are things that we call error traps, but in common language, we can talk uh, about error traps as a challenges or difficulties that people face. So that's an easy way to introduce um, this to, for workers. What, uh, tell me about the challenges uh, related to doing this task. So this is the, uh, different aspects of integrating HF into risk assessment, including forms, training, um, etc. Let's move to the next topic. So this will be about the procedures. Um, why people don't follow the rules and procedures? That's a, not a new question. I've been around for decades uh, with aviation, nuclear, other high risk industries, putting a lot of effort to understand it. We've got many studies. Um, showing the reasons behind it. And this is a result of one of those studies. This table is based on the um, interviews with over 400 um, workers from a um, high risk onshore facility. And we see here a range. Um, uh, yes, Gina, it will be available. Um, so we, here we see a range of different uh, challenges that workers face when trying to use procedures. Um, so uh, I won't go through every single one, but let's look at the range. So accuracy, they're out of date or inaccurate. Practicality, um, procedures make the work more difficult to do or unworkable in practice. Um, there is a better way to, to do the job. Um, how the content is presented, right? So um, it's difficult to find the right procedure or they are difficult to use or it has a hundred pages and you just need one paragraph for your job and there is no list of contents, um, all real examples. Um, people don't understand why they're um, necessary, etc. So, um, so you see here the range of 
uh, reasons. Now, that's not the end because you could ask a question if you consider a procedure or a rule as a as an aid or a guidance or a form of risk reduction, right? And let's say that the procedure is out of date and inaccurate, meaning it doesn't represent the reality. We could ask a question, why an organization allowed a procedure to be, say, out of date, right? And that takes us to the organizational factors, um, and that may include how we manage the our documents, right? So do we use the do we monitor the use of procedures? Do we evaluate the error traps in the procedures? Uh, how easy it is to uh, in, introduce improvements? What about the software? So thinking about the usability uh, of that. So can the user your worker easily and quickly find the document they they need? Are people trained? Um, uh, on the, what the procedures are and how to how to use them. Uh, is this a part of a competency verification? Those points are, are as per the UK HSC guidance uh, on procedure management. Are workers involved um, in writing procedures? So you see here that the usability challenges stemming are stemming from how we manage the documentation and some other organizational factors. So now having um, discuss that. Let's again, let's do a quick benchmarking um, to see uh, whether uh, whether you're integrating um, human factors with uh, your procedure management. Uh, again, I'll go through that and uh, tick yes, uh, yes or no, and that will give you a uh, simplified um, potential gap where you may need to um, look into. So, when you write procedures, employees who will be using these documents are involved in all stages of the effort. Procedures are based on how the task is actually performed. So that's important that the documents are not written uh, out there in the office by somebody who has never been to the work uh, where the work is, uh, is happening. Task analysis is a one simple tool that can be used here. Uh, it's just going through uh, with the person doing the job through the steps of how it's actually done. Number three, uh, if there are better ways, because workers learn over time and they come up with optimizations, so better ways of performing the task are integrated into the formal procedure. So are you capturing the ongoing improvements? With shortcuts, with the, the same rationale, we've covered that, so let's jump to number five. Um, there is a control and a review process in place to keep procedures relevant and up to date as things change over time. Then number six and seven emphasize the importance of feedback from the operators. Operators say that procedures are easy to use, navigate and understand. And that's important because it's about the end users. It's all good if the engineer in the office think that this is the, the document is fantastic. But if actually people doing it, using it in the front line uh, are not saying that, then that will be affecting um, how, how they interact with the document. And number seven, operators say that the procedures are easy and quick to access. So you see here that it's not only about the content of the document, the formatting, the wording, the precision accuracy, but it's also about the environment. So how easy it is for me to find it, for example, or report uh, issues or potential um, improvements. Eight procedures are connected to training and competency management, um, and any updates are reflected in the uh, updated training. And number nine, procedure management system ensures that there are no conflicting uh, requirements or multiple uh, procedures covering the same topics. So this is a high level overview of what it means to integrate human factors with procedure management. Let's move to the next one. So investigations, and this will be again high level overview. There is much more to it, uh, but here I hope that um, I'll, uh, I'll be able to um, uh, offer you the direction where you can uh, learn more, and there is more uh, resources links in the uh, in the guide. So, 
This comes from the report published by the Energy Institute. The example is that the incident is the person uh, injured their hand whilst reaching in into the pipe cutting machine to retrieve the pipe. OK, and so this is an example. This table shows an example of depth of the investigation and related um, recommendations or improvement actions. And so what you see here is at the top, you've got the top um, row is the example of uh, findings. The bottom row is example of corrective actions and the columns uh, represent the depth. And so what we see here in uh, level one is that we say operator is to blame because they reached into the machine and so we should discipline the person. And you see the red cross there um, because this is not an acceptable finding or a solution because it doesn't change anything. It doesn't, uh, we haven't learned anything um, and we, don't we haven't improved anything by doing so. So we move to level two. Now, operator believed that lifting the guard would disable the machine. OK, so that's better. So we are getting into the uh, what they were thinking and the rationale. So that's good. But if we look at the uh, corresponding corrective action, it says retrain the operator in all aspects of the operating machine. And that's not acceptable. So let's see why is that? We tend to, as an industry, we tend to jump to train and train and train, while often this is not the most optimal solution. So at level three, we see that the operator received the training, but the machine used um, on uh, in the workplace, on the shop floor, was different from the machine used in training. So there was a mismatch between one the machine used in training and the machine that they used for the job. And so that's better now because it makes sense why they were expecting the machine to stop. Um, and the, the recommendation is that the training should be completed on the machine in specific uh, that was used in the training. So the, the machine should be the same. And at level four, at levels four and five, we are moving towards organizational factors. So level four finding, we see the machine was not fully tested before being put to use. And level five finding, it was needed quickly and the procurement process did not require the machine purchase to have safety interlock. And the corresponding corrective actions is to amend the procedure for introducing new equipment and in, uh, amend the procurement uh, procedure to um, improve the risk assessment. So you see here how we transition from blame the person through error traps, so conditions that resulted um, in a mistake or in compliance towards um, organizational factors. And so um, at the very foundation level, this is what it means to integrate um, human factors into the investigation process. And let's do a quick benchmarking again. So in this case, uh, you've got two tables. You've got examples, what good looks like on the left, and the common examples that show that you may not be there as yet. Uh, and so for our benchmarking, let's um, let's focus on um, on the right hand side. OK, so let's say. You think about recent investigations reports that your organization uh, produced and let's um, think whether you would find any of those points in there. So claim that there was a one root cause. Um, co common causes such as human error, human behavior or procedural non-compliance as a last cause in the report. The incident happened because people didn't follow the rules or because they did something or because they made an error. Use of judgmental labels as an explanation. So this happened because people got complacent, people got careless um, or type of biases as well. So for example, this happened because people got overconfident. That's another, um, um, perhaps another webinar for why biases are, uh, using biases as an explanation is limiting our corrective efforts. Um, but overall, uh, it means that just focusing on the bias uh, may be at the cost of understanding error traps and organizational factors. Um, and then number four, causes or conclusions, findings that focused only on the on what the person didn't do 
or should have done. And that is because just saying that the person didn't do something does not tell you much about what they did and why they did it. OK, it's the same with should have done. The fact that you're saying they should have done something different does not explain why they did what they did. Um, and uh, corrective actions, uh, if they are mainly behavioral, so who remind them, retrain them, uh, appeal them or consequence management and administrative. So just change, um, change the rule, change the uh, change the procedure or um, that is. Um, that is uh, limiting um, as well. So you see those um, those um, combinations. And uh, the last topic for today, uh, given our time, is I would like to um, talk briefly about proactive learning. So that is finding causes of accidents before they happen. So typically we think that if a task is completed without an incident, it is a success. Only a very small percentage of all activities result in undesired event and the vast majority of activities are completed without a problem. And as a result, it's easy to think that no additional work is needed. Does it mean, however, that all those activities that didn't result in an event were executed flawlessly? Rarely is attention paid to how the activities were completed, what challenges were encountered and where seeds of a future accident evident. And so learning from normal work, also known as pre-accident investigations or learning from success, is about proactively looking into things that make the work difficult, increase the chance of errors, and how dependencies between different groups may contribute to incidents in the future. When there is an incident, it's easy to think that it happened because something went wrong. For example, somebody didn't identify a hazard or didn't move away from the line of fire. Similarly, when a job is completed without an incident, it's easy to assume that all hazards were identified, all procedures were followed, and all controls were applied. When things go wrong in organizations, our assumptions tend to be that something or someone malfunctioned or failed. When things go right, as they do most of the time, we assume everything worked as imagined. Success and failure are the four thought to be fundamentally different. We think there is something special about unwanted occurrences. However, when wanted or unwanted events occur, people are often doing the same sorts of things that they usually do, ordinary work. They may miss the hazard, work in the line of fire, skip steps in the procedure. What differs is the set of circumstances, interactions, and patterns of variability in the surrounding conditions. And so what does it all mean in practice? It means that the conditions that will create our next accident exist today and we can find and address them before they lead to an accident. And here is an example. In one of our workshops, a team was working with these large pool. This is a seven ton spool being lifted with a standard 10 ton crane. You can see the size of the spool on the picture. The spool needed to be lifted 15 centimeters and moved across the room. And you would think, well, OK, that's not that difficult to do, but it is. One of the things that we picked up on was that the operator was a little too close to the spool. And the reason was the crane control was a, uh, I'm sorry, was a cable type system, which was limiting where the operator could stand and what he could see, therefore requiring a spotter. The spotter was on the other side of the spool and it was difficult to see each other, so they had to use verbal commands. When we started looking at the crane controls, it had left, right, forward and backwards type buttons on there. So depending on the orientation of the spotter versus the crane operator and the limited visibility, you could easily make a mistake in the direction you wanted the crane to move. And so we decided that if they just used a remote control and then put some directional indicators using things like east and west and then line up the equipment so that everything was moving in a particular direction. The crane operator could move around and he always knew what direction he was going. And by making the simple improvement, we eliminated the need for the spotter and for using verbal communication. So few additional learnings. If there was an accident, 
while moving the load, we probably would have found exactly the same things we found now. And number two, the typical risk assessment for that such a lifting activity would not identify the factors that we've identified and the type of um, error traps. And so this is an example of proactive learning where we talk to people about what makes the job difficult to learn about error traps um, and dependencies between different teams. So we haven't covered all the questions uh, from the SQL, but again, the SPE guide uh, will aid you uh, with that. And let's now, um, let's now uh, focus on some of the uh, questions uh, that we have. Please um, um, type in any questions, so we'll uh, collate uh, our answers. Um, we got a few questions or, initially. Uh, later on if we don't have a chance to um, to answer them. We um, have a couple of questions. Are okay. we able to answer them now? So let me um, let me see. Thank you, um, Sarhi. I'm uh, looking whether we have any questions about SQL. Um, Okay, so Carl asks, could it be a good idea for companies to employ professional writers to write procedures, working together with domain experts? Um, so, Carl, in my experience, um, professional writers uh, have a role uh, to play here because they will be uh, familiar with forms of editing and, uh, and language. However, I would highlight two other things. Just using a technical writer who may not be familiar with the industrial risks may not be enough um, because there are certain rules how you write steps with the action words, etc. HPOG published a separate guidance recently on uh, procedure formatting. Uh, that's number one. The second one, the second point is about usability. Um, so just the fact that you have perfectly formatted document does not necessarily mean that those perfectly formatted steps represents reality, represents the best practice. And of course you need the um, the users, but then there is more to usability as well. So preferably it would be good if, if you did a risk um, task analysis um, on uh, and be able to identify other conditions that influence um, the uh, what makes the job difficult. And so whether your technical writer is able to do that may depend on their background and their uh, profile. Um, okay, so um, Sati, this question may be for you. Um, are clients using both SQL as well as FPOL? Is the expectation that organizations need both going forward? And what's the difference between FPOL and SQL? I'll, I'll take the second one first. Um, really, FPL and SQL are offer relatively similar services. Um, so SQL is an alternative um, to FPL. Um, it's it's a, a newer service. We have different um, buyers using uh, SQL and using FPL. So the SQL buyers um, have committed to using SQL exclusively um, for pre-qualification. Um, so those buyers that I um, showed up on the slides earlier, um, they, as I say, they are they are using SQL exclusively. Um, buyers who choose to, you know, as the buyers are free to choose which um, service they wish to use. So as a as a as a service, we are certainly um, interested in recruiting more buyers into using SQL. So we'll continue to do that and we'll obviously continue to announce um, any new buyers that come in. I think there's a couple of um, a, a few of the buyer um, uh, representatives here on today. So I can see um, Elaine um, from Harbour, Craig from Shell um, actively uh, confirming that, that they are um, uh, exclusively using SQL. So um, I think that that gives gives you that um, confirmation uh, as well. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much. And we see some examples. So Shell, for example, um, only uses um, 
uh, SQL. Um, so will there be a facility to submit feedback as on FPAL? Um, yes, we are bringing in a uh, feedback functionality um, later this year. So we've already had a couple of uh, sessions with SQL buyer members and SQL supplier members together as well um, to, you know, to, to get your feedback on the feedback functionality that's that's being designed um, and the feedback um, questions that will be um, issued. Uh, again, they'll be the, obviously the same questions um, that uh, everybody will be answering. So there will be a set of questions or template of questions that the buyers will respond for um, suppliers and that suppliers will be able to give feedback to buyers as well. And quite a few of the questions are based on the industry supply chain principles as well. Oh, fantastic, thank you. Um, and a lot of the information submitted through SQL is reviewed by SQL for acceptance, while a lot of information around HEC and Q is technical information and now with human factors added. So do SQL employees uh, or do SQL employ uh, subject matter experts to review this information for suitable suitableness? Yes, as I say, the, the assessor criteria um, initially has been determined by um, technical experts, so Marcin included, um, but also the, um, the buyer's internal um, HSE teams um, have all contributed to how they were assessing those um, questions internally and therefore how they're being um, assessed in SQL as well. So that's the criteria that's been supplied to the assessment team um, who carry out the desktop assessment reviews. Um, the, um, the team who review the HSC question sets particularly are NIBOSH qualified as well. So they do have that um, some level of technical um, expertise as well as relying on the SQL training um, and guidance for that. And then we do continuously um, review that and uh, act on feedback and, and look to improve on that as well with our buyers and suppliers. Fantastic. Um, thank you. Um, so um, I wanted to come back to the Philip's question. Uh, he asks, can you clarify your meaning of behavioral based safety? So under this umbrella, um, Philip, we see a range of different things happening from uh, observation and uh, conversation programs to sophisticated uh, employee engagement efforts focused on understanding uh, how behavior uh, results from the interaction with their environment. So um, in the US, there is this organization called Cambridge Center for Behavioral Studies. This is a non-for-profit that, um, that um, brings together the academic and practitioner experts who have um, specific expertise in the science of uh, behavioral change in uh, organizations. And so um, they've got a certification process for behavior-based uh, systems. And this is what we refer to in the guide um, because that's the only certification programs that I'm aware of um, that uh, combine that is based and um, and relies on the the apl practical applications of science uh, as part of the certification. And so um, that that is an engagement program that sees uh, behavior as a form uh, as an outcome of the interaction with the work environment over time. And so the engagement with the employees helps us to understand how the work arrangement uh, may be resulting in uh, in different behaviors and how we then can optimize the work environment in order to um, drive the behaviors. And then you also see other developments, whether that's behavioral systems or, uh, or others that look into um, modifying and adjusting high level uh, processes in organizations to help with um, achieving the um, behavior that uh, that is desired. So this is what we uh, what we're referring to there. So with this said, um, thank you very much for um, for your time uh, today. I will take your questions and um, uh, and uh, collate answers to them and publish those. We will also be sharing slides as part of the um, 
our um, follow up. And um, I'll hand over to Caroline for the closing remarks. Hi there. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Perfect, thank you. Um, so thank you very much for attending this morning's sessions. I see we've had a, a few queries, but just to remind you that we will be sending out the slides after today's event. Um, we, the session is also be recorded, so that will also be available. Um, we come into uh, quarter two of um, Step Change and Safety's quarterly themes of human factors. So please do visit our web page for further information regarding uh, a wide range of human factors um, topics. Um, also, we have an additional two webinars coming up um, throughout quarter two. Um, so if you have a look on the Eventbrite um, web page, just as you did for this session, and please do sign up. We'll have some um, excellent speakers. Um, as Marcin says, if you have any additional questions, um, either uh, put them in the chat or don't hesitate to contact us directly and we will sort of collate them and respond to them and make sure that everybody is involved. So again, thank you very much for your time and we hope to speak to you soon. Take care. Bye now. Thank you very much.